So the new Trump appointments, or basically the new Trump nominees, uh, seem to be, you know, very pro-fracking, obviously. This, you know, in other news, water is wet. But there's also some pro-nuclear stuff in there. So what is going on? Uh, the Trump administration is taking shape, and as Energy Secretary Trump has nominated Chris Wright the CEO of Liberty Energy, and Liberty Energy is in the business of fracking. Doug Burgum, governor of North Dakota, is nominated as energy czar. Well, not exactly energy czar, but he, he will be the secretary that has, you know, the power over all the federal lands, right? I believe it's the Department of Interior. Of I, I don't know exactly what it's called. And but we have to get back to Trump's goals. His goals are to establish U.S. energy independence and U.S. energy dominance. So what's also pretty clear right now is that all of Biden's current climate and energy policies are under threat. So in this video, I'm going to check, you know, I'm going to show you what looks bad about these nominees. We are going to took a, take a look at Chris Wright's Battering Human Lives report and what do I expect what is going to happen once they get confirmed. First, some news over here, PBS News. Trump picks North Dakota Governor Governor Burgum to run Interior Department, that's it, Interior Department, and New Energy Council. Right. Uh, the main thing about Bergam is that he comes from North Dakota and North Dakota basically is a fossil fuel state. And you really there is almost nothing to find about this man, uh, especially when we are looking, you know, when we are trying to find his views on nuclear energy, simply non-existent uh, over here. Roll call. Uh, same thing, he's going to, <laughs> this is interesting, I won't tell you his name, it might be something like Bergam, Trump said, he's going to head the Department of Interior, and he's going to be fantastic. Um, the interesting bit about him is that he recognizes how important our federal lands are for energy and mineral production. Uh, this this is this is very interesting because this is this is going to uh, to become very relevant in the future. Uh, you, you see here, at the Guardian environmental groups are alarmed as Doug Burgum picked for U.S. In Interior Secretary. And the main thing that these people are afraid of is that they are going to let fossil fuel companies uh, basically drill for oil and gas on federal lands. Now, the other guy, Trump chooses oil fracking boss's energy secretary. Uh, here we are talking about Chris Wright. Now, the interesting bit about Chris Wright is, yes, he is very big in the fracking industry, but he is also someone who is involved with nuclear. So that's pretty interesting. And, and, there, and, he, and he has this... Um, this report that he wrote, the Bettering Human Lives report, which is something that I'm going to share. But, you know, there, there's obviously a lot of stuff that we need to cover. So Axios, Denver, uh, Chris Wright, why it matters. If confirmed, the appointment puts Wright an evangelist for the oil and gas industry and decreased regulation in a position to expand production and, indirect, and redirect billions in climate and energy-related spending from the Inflation Reduction Act. So these are, these are interesting times um, that we are living in. We are in the twi twilight zone. Uh, and, and we really don't know what is going to happen. Is everything going to land up, upside down? Uh, is everything going to land upside down in the future, or are we going forward? So what looks bad about Doug Burgum? Burgum, not Burgum. Uh, Burgum seems to have no qualms about using federal lands for the exploitation of fossil fuels. Burgum seems to have little to no experience with nuclear, and I've tried to establish a pattern, you know, about him talking about nuclear, but he, he has almost never said anything about nuclear energy. So the man really is an enigma to me. I really, I really don't know. I've, I've tried to Google him and tried to see what he has to say about nuclear. All I could find was that he, he, he visited a, a nuclear arsenal or a nuclear base, a Minot Air Base, 
uh, and, and he had something to say about that. But honestly, I, I don't know anything about the man. I don't know anything uh, about his stance on nuclear and whether that will, you know, be positive or negative. I, I, I simply can't tell. So what looks bad about Chris Wright? Uh, Wright doesn't think that climate change is a serious problem. He focuses more on the humanistic aspect of making sure everyone has access to cheap energy. He talks uh, he talks a lot about propane, by the way, which is something that I agree on with him because you know the the main trouble in the world currently, as we as as we are experiencing today, is that most of the poor people in the world they don't have access to any clean energy. Even propane will be clean energy to these people. They are still burning wood. They're still burning animal droppings uh, in order to heat their homes, to cook their meals. And just the particulate matter, a lot of people are dying because they become ill uh, because they live in a dirty environment. So, you know, what he says about, about climate change, this is a real background phenomenon, but it's just wildly misrepresented for political and media and all sorts of other reasons and that gets in the way of things. Uh, I don't think that climate change is a background phenomenon. I really think that once it punches us in the face, it will punch us in the face and we will lose some teeth. Uh, so you better take it seriously. But the thing about Chris Wright is the way he talks. I've been listening to the podcast, the uh, Power Hungry Cup podcast, where he talked about climate change and other things. Uh, I think that he is somebody I would be able to talk with, and, and I and I would be able to see eye to eye. We would still have some, you know, some 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 differences at the end of that of that debate, but we would be able to see eye to eye. That that's what I believe about him. There isn't a huge valley between us, but you know, you still need a bridge. Otherwise, you would get wet feet if you would have to cross over one or the other. So, uh, what seems to be good? Um, well, as I said, there's not anything nuclear related, nuclear energy related that Doug Burgum said that you know I I might uh, view as hopeful. Chris Wright, on the other hand, is on the board of Oklo and is an investor. And for those who don't know, Oklo is a company that designs a liquid metal fast breeder reactor. So he's actually a board member of a nuclear company. So over here, this is Oklo. Here we have the board of investors, Chris Wright. You know, Chris Wright has served as the chairman of the board and chief executive officer of Liberty Energy since its founder in 2011, right? This is all about his, you know, his business dealings, basically. It's like a CV, a small CV. Here it's outlined that he is, you know, he's really big in the commercial gas shale gas production world so yes i mean i i get that these that these uh nuclear startups need these people in their boards because if you want to make headway into you know the world of energy you have to have people from the world of energy in your board in order to make to make uh you know to to make a commercial product actually stick when it's that time then we have the Bettering Human Lives Report. I've been browsing through the Human Lives Report over here. 51 mentions of nuclear. Uh, unfortunately, it's very small, so I can't really show you, but I'm going to make sure that a link to the report is in, uh, is in, the, uh, is in the description down below. He does talk about nuclear in a positive sense. He does think that nuclear is is one of the technologies that can actually uh, achieve a meaningful percentage in the primary energy space. He, he believes that it can reach 10%. I hope that it can reach more, uh, but at least he, he, he sees potential for nuclear. And that's, that's I, I believe, the, the thing that I was looking for uh, when I saw that he was being nominated as energy secretary. So the risk assessment, because this is obviously what we're all here for, uh, gas and oil are the big winners because they are much quicker on their feet and they have, you know, they now have the backing of the, or when these people get 
uh, confirmed, which I don't doubt that they, I mean, I don't doubt that they won't, that they, I don't doubt that they will be confirmed. Uh, when these people get confirmed, uh, then, then the oil and gas industry really, really are in a good position. So they can capitalize quickly on new development possibilities. So if this, this dog, Berkham says, okay, you can now uh, explore for uh, shale gas in Yellowstone Park or wherever, you know, near, near these federal lands, someplace where other people would have thought that it might be impossible to actually look for these resources, that, that, that might now become a possibility. Uh, the reason why this uh, this will go faster is because they have little to no regulatory burden, especially compared to nuclear. So if we are going to weigh who will win more of this because of you know the actions of this administration, the nuclear will certainly not win more because nuclear simply is not fast enough on it. It's not quick on its own feet. Uh, nuclear may have a very tough time competing in this space. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. Think about the construction of a natural gas plant, for instance. A natural gas plant get, gets built in two years. You know, somebody says, okay, here's the step. You can build it. You make your final investment decision. And two or three years later, a, a, a an 800 megawatt natural gas plant is producing electricity somewhere. It, it, it's just that much faster. Nuclear, on the other hand, has a high regulatory burden. You have to you have to deliver you, you, you have to deliver documents, ten thousand pages worth of documents each time you need to explain something. Um, just just the paperwork alone, pushing all that paper, it, it, it's an incredible burden. Not to mention the time that it takes for everybody to review these papers to make sure that every Every dot, every I has been dotted. I mean, it's just ridiculous. It's it's too much. There's no mechanism currently under you know the nuclear industry. There's no mechanism at this moment that is really looking to reduce construction costs. You have the small modular reactors, which means that the capital burden of a nuclear power plant is less, but because of the you know, the economies of scale and the economies of numbers. What you get is when you make your reactor bigger, eventually the materials footprint of that bigger reactor is smaller than the materials footprint of the smaller reactor when you look at it from a per kilowatt perspective. So in the end, the smaller the smaller nuclear reactor has to, you know, it basically has to bear a slightly higher cost, which means which means that the cost to produce electricity is also higher in the smaller reactor than in the bigger reactor. But that doesn't mean that the smaller reactor's cost is prohibitively high. You know, there's there's still plenty of business cases out there for this marginally higher electricity cost that comes from the smaller reactor. That's something that people in this space who are discussing whether to build small or big are missing. It's it's a nuance and, and it's a it's a real nuance. However, if you start if you have to compete with natural gas, that is pretty unrestricted. There are no longer any carbon costs, uh, for instance. Then the smaller reactor absolutely cannot compete with natural gas. It's just that that simple. Uh, you know, forget about renewables right now because because we're now leaving the, the the world where renewables are the next big thing. We're now getting back to where gas plants are the next big thing. And nuclear is set to compete within that space. And if it's really a free market economy that these that these people are going to pursue, then nuclear is going to fall by the wayside. Natural gas will basically capitalize the entire market as much as it possibly can. And, and that's just a big, big, big risk. So this is this is very essential. There are no short-term prospects for large nuclear reactors when gas can do the same quicker and cheaper. And the nuclear industry has not re-established itself yet. Yes, we've now managed to finish Vogel 3 and 4. VC Summer might get finished. I mean, they're talking about it right now. 
But those are the only real nuclear power construction projects that were done in the United States. And once bar, I believe once bar three, which which was a 25 year construction project. Right now you have the, you know, they, they are building, they are building a, 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 a versatile test reactor. They are building, Kairos is building their first uh, test reactor. TerraPower is building their test reactor. It's all, it's all in the, the, the initial stages. You know, we're not, to, I, I don't know how far they are with the, with the advanced test reactor. I believe that that thing has been quite has been constructed but all other stuff they're just breaking ground no concrete has been poured so if the u.s would be the the best thing the u.s could do right now right now biden would have to pick up the phone and contact trump and say listen uh i want us to have a healthy nuclear industry i want us to be able to build nuclear power reactors you and I both know that that is good for the U.S., so I'm going to approve, the, you know, five construction projects, 10, 10 AP-1000 reactors, here, 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 and here, and here. Do we agree? I will bet you that Trump and Biden could agree on such an idea right now, and they could shake hands, and they could say, okay, we're doing this in order to improve the prospects of nuclear and improve the prospects of America, because this is what ensures that nuclear of this is what ensures that the United States will achieve energy dominance, right? But 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 what we might see happen, and this is because because everything is up in the air. We're still in the twilight zone. Biden pro nuclear policies might get axed. So we have three really important pieces of policy that are hugely conducive hugely positive for nuclear which are which is the inflation reduction act you know we're talking about tax credits for nuclear power plants but we're also talking about funding for next generation nuclear technologies such as smrs we have the bipartisan infrastructure law where they have allocated six billion for a civil nuclear civil nuclear credit program which is the program that helped save diablo canyon but we also have the ARDP, the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program. Now, this last one is the thing that I don't think is going to be axed because it actually started, the whole process of the ARDP, started at the end of Trump's first administration. So this might actually be seen as a Trump legacy pro-nuclear policy. But the other two policies might get axed and, and have to redo the pro-nuclear stuff up front. We don't know that. We, we don't know that. So what are the chances for nuclear? Because there's all, it, it's not all doom and gloom. There's maybe, there may all also be some, some light on, at the horizon. You know, we, we, we may see that the, the, the NRC gets a really tough period where they either get overhauled or they might actually get destroyed. The NRC, this administration, the upcoming administration may actually be the administration that is going to end the NRC. Now, whether that is good or bad, I don't know. Honestly, I, I have no idea. What is what will be positive for nuclear is if they actually actually manage to get a reduction in regulatory regulatory stress. That if you want to apply for a license for a new nuclear power reactor, a new nuclear construction project somewhere in the United States, that you can do that quite quickly. Ideally, you want to have that process take no longer than two years, right? From beginning to end. Okay, two years, we decide, okay, we can we can actually build this thing at this position, at this place. We know what the we know what the geology what the geology is there. We know uh, we know about the availability of cooling water. All of that is well understood. We know that when you build you know, an AP-1000 there, it will withstand whatever the area can throw at it. It will have enough water. So here's your stamp, build your AP-1000 there. That's what I hope personally, personally, that's what I hope will happen there. Um, other chances, keeping the pro-nuclear government incentives alive, 
spoke about ARDP, but perhaps also the good parts of the in, in, about the Inflation Reduction Act. And 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 here are two things that you know. This is this is a little bit of idealism from my side. You know that the understanding of the true value of nuclear will spur the Trump admin to proactively move forward on nuclear deployments through the AP one thousands, at least ten of them. With you know decide to do this in the first month of your administration. If Trump does something like that, if he's not just busy axing stuff, but he's also doing some something constructive. You know, Chris Wright says, listen, we need to build these AP-1000s. Let, let's get going on these AP-1000s. If they do that, that's a positive sign. But if they are going to act stuff that will impact nuclear as well, and that will make, that will, in the end, make the nuclear industry become, you know, that it, that it, that it falls by the wayside again, that, that would not be a great sign. And, you know, I believe that energy dominance, as Trump sees it, is not just exporting fuel, but would also mean exporting reactor technologies, AP-1000, AP-300 or X-300 or whatever is available at that point, which is American and requires American involvement diplomatically, you know, because you have to strike a diplomatic deal with a country X, Y, and Z. Okay, you can, you know, there's export controls on nuclear technology, so you can't just knock on the door at Westinghouse and say, hey, I want to build an AP-1000, if you're England, for instance. First thing you need to do in Westinghouse is, okay, that, that's fine, but first you have to talk to you know our government representatives at your consulate or at your embassy, because we need to set up this, you know, this diplomatic talk about whether we can export this nuclear technology to your country, yes or no. It's not a given that that can happen. You, have, you really need to establish international relations in order to do this. But in any case, I think that this is the energy dominance part that might help nuclear. I'm still very much... Uh, 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 <laughs> It's, it's, it's an uneasy feeling that I have currently about nuclear in the United States, prospects for nuclear. They've never been this good. We have to acknowledge that. The nuclear roadmap that was, that was presented by the Department of Energy, you know, just uh, one or two weeks ago, that's, that's an amazing piece of work. And if the Department of Energy under Chris Wright will actually uh, commit to this nuclear roadmap, then... It will be smooth sailing from here on out. But we don't know whether the Trump administration is going to do that. We don't know whether Chris Wright is going to do that. Right? I, I, I mean, everything is up in the air currently. We are in the twilight zone. So with that, you have made it. You've reached the end of this video. I want to thank my paying Patreon members. Please consider becoming one. Uh, it helps to keep the lights on in my house. If you have something to contribute to the discussion, please leave a comment down below. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you all for watching. I made a strong force be with you. Bye-bye.